It's my pleasure to introduce Richard Heaton, who is the Permanent Secretary of the Cabinet Office. Um, he trained as a barrister. I'll come back to that in a second. He trained as a barrister, um, joined the Home Office in 91, which uh, I think my calculation is about 23 years ago. Um, has worked on criminal law, constitution, human rights, uh, done a great deal in the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, but two things I want to say about Richard that uh, you might not know from the bio. Firstly, he works with a charity in South London, looking after armed houses and um, contributing to community development. And he said the best decision of his life that he ever made was where he sold his gown and wig in exchange for a wetsuit. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, David. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yes, the trade happened in a, in a pub in Fleet Street, as I recall, uh, a long time ago. Um, uh, David, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for asking me um, uh, to come and speak here. It's a great honour to be here. It's a great pleasure um, walking across um, the park on this gorgeous spring day in London, kind of feeling that anything can happen. Um, it's great to be here. Um, a disclaimer, just building on that introduction. Um, uh, I am not a scientist um, beyond a couple of science A-levels a long time ago. I'm not a scientist, nor am I a policymaker uh, by trade. Uh, most of my career, not all of it, most of it I've been a government lawyer. Um, and for most of that time I've been in the business of, of making laws, of helping to create laws. So I've been kind of closely involved um, in a particular sort of policy making, um, the sort that tends to see uh, you know, the setting up of regulatory regime or rules, um, setting up of public bodies, national rollouts, that sort of policy. Um, and now I've got two jobs. That's why that, um, that label is quite so long. First Parliamentary Council, um, uh, I head up the government's team of professional law drafters. And our task is to convey as clearly and accessibly and accurately as we can the endless adjustments and additions and subtractions that are proposed every year to our accumulated body of statute law. It's, it's not an easy job. Uh, drafters deal with almost unimaginable complexity. Uh, and if you think, as I occasionally do, of our sprawling statutes as society's rule book, as our operating system, I kind of tend to get a bit uneasy. Um, it's not an easy read, it's very complicated, it's layered, it's wonderfully full of data. Statute law is wonderfully full of data, but despite being public, it wouldn't pass any of the tests that we associate with open data. It doesn't have that sort of works straight out of the box feel to it. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the law here today. Um, that particular problem and what we're trying to do about it and our good law campaign is, is for another day. Today, I'm mostly wearing my other hat in my other job as Permanent Secretary in the Cabinet Office. Uh, we, in the Cabinet Office, we're a small department in policy terms. Uh, we lead for the government on uh, constitutional policy uh, and the electoral system, all that, and on civil society and the voluntary sector and on emergency planning and, and a few other things. So we're a kind of medium-sized, small policy department. Um, but we're also the department that coordinates policy decision-making so that collective government works properly. And um, we also promote and house, develop, incubate a number of emerging techniques and approaches which might illustrate uh, what the future of policy making is in government. Might do. They might not. Let's face it. None of us quite know what's, what, what's going to happen next. So, for example, we host the government digital service. Uh, we hold a minority share in the behavioural insights team. Uh, we do open data. We promote social investment uh, and, and quite a lot more. So, so um, I was really pleased to be asked to speak today on the subject of innovative policy making. It's something that we think about quite a lot in the Cabinet Office, and indeed it's something we do quite a lot of as well. Um, sometimes tentatively, uh, sometimes with a bit more confidence, um, but always, I hope, critically and uh, with a spirit of inquiry. Um, and uh, David, just as you pay tribute um, uh, to your folk at the centre, the Cabinet Office has some, some fantastic people um, who are kind of inquiring uh, and really smart and innovative and analytical. So today, uh, I want to look at why this seems to be a time for innovation in policy making. What's, what's going on? What's happening right now? Why is this a time for innovation? Then at what policy innovation might look like, uh, what it means for public services and for government. Uh, and finally, I want to explore some of the implications um, for open policy making um, on our democracy, our way of doing things. So, why is this a time for innovation? Um, what does the climate look like from, from within government, within Whitehall? Well, um, if you think of the various constraints that face any government, any civil service trying to get stuff done right at the moment, um, the most obvious constraint is uh, the financial one, fiscal one. Budgets in departments, um, as elsewhere, budgets in the departments have been falling for several years. 
Uh, the next spending round will probably be after the election, 2015. It will continue that trend. We'll face another parliament, probably, of continuing fiscal consolidation. So budget constraints, the biggest, the biggest constraint. We just can't afford the sort of policy interventions uh, and functions that we might have happily uh, put in place without a second thought a decade ago. So that's the first. Um, second, uh, the size of the challenges we face have not shrunken with our budgets. So Britain's, just to take three big, big, kind of knotty, difficult problems, Britain's ageing demographic is not going to go away. Climate change is upon us. Engaging and educating a younger generation is as important as it was before the crash. Um, uh, so the problems uh, haven't gone away, uh, they remain as great. Thirdly, people expect services, public service, private services, um, to be available when they need them uh, and where they need them. Retailers get this, uh, and we've got to get it in government as well. And finally, um, for those of us uh, working in central government, uh, we've got some very clear political direction. Uh, we, uh, uh, we must promote growth in the economy. We must rebalance the economy between the public and private sectors. We must rebalance the economy geographically as well. So taken together, that's a pretty tall order. Um, that's a pretty formidable set of challenges. No money, huge challenges, demand for better services, oh, and get the economy moving as well. Um, it cries out for something more than uh, incremental change, incremental efficiencies. It cries out for looking for new ways of approaching problems. That's become a necessity. And I think one other thing, that just as being parochial as a civil servant, one other thing is certain, if we in government, in the civil service, are not able and prepared to be innovative in the face of that towering set of objectives, I think the future for public services is pretty bleak, and I think the civil service would be utterly spent. I say that really frankly. I'm an unashamed defender of the civil service as the institution that can be trusted to translate political direction into action. And I do think, I believe, uh, that we will adapt successfully to these changing times, but it is a real challenge for us. I think it's almost existential. Uh, in fact, um, I think one of the reasons uh, it is such an interesting place to be, the civil service right at the moment, is actually that license, that requirement uh, to innovate and to think creatively. Um, I don't think I recognised that 20 years ago when I joined the Home Office. Uh, you certainly get it now. Um, the licence to borrow from what other countries are doing, the licence to join in and learn from the conversations online, um, to learn from conversations, real conversations, amongst folks such as are here today. Um, uh, to I mean, put it another way, if you're in retail uh, or energy generation or farming or uh, broadcasting or banking, um, you're going to be looking for ways to innovate. Uh, to find new markets, to respond to changing consumer patterns, to anticipate them, to seek competitive advantage through new technology, um, to take costs out of your business. Uh, if you're running a charity, and David mentioned the charity that I'm involved in with South of the River, you will be looking for new ways of attracting financing, perhaps new ways of investing in communities to do more things uh, with less money. Um, it would be really odd, wouldn't it, if the same sense of urgency wasn't to be found in government, which after all spends something like one pound in every seven pounds of GDP, and which has so many competing demands on it. So that's the, that's the why now question for me. Innovation has to be an inherent feature of government, as in any other sector of the economy. And once you accept that, suddenly government becomes a really fascinating and rewarding place. It's, uh, it's attractive to entrepreneurial types. The challenges no longer seem impossible, no longer seem so desperate. The tools that become available to us show us that actually maybe we can do this. We can meet these challenges, do things radically differently and better and cheaper. Uh, and that kind of sense uh, brings uh, optimism. And I'm a huge believer in optimism, just as I'm a huge fan of lovely spring days in London, because I think optimism is one of those really stimulating things for any organisation uh, and any group of people. So that's some... Um, uh, that's a kind of bit of context. So, um, what what then does what does innov innovative policy making look like? This is where this is where it gets a bit difficult. So, um, for a start, government's no stranger to te technological innovation. That's that's clear. Um, so, take any any number of examples: Basil Jett's sewers uh, in the 19th century, supercomputers in the 1960s turned up in government first. Uh, defence and security applications today are pretty cutting edge. Um, uh, so there's nothing new uh, in novelty or in innovation, technically. Um, governments has long sponsored new and radical transformational policies as well, um, from the welfare state in the 1940s to privatisation in the 1980s. So, so doing cutting-edge stuff isn't new, but I, what I want to talk about is, is, is the practice and discipline of just doing policymaking. How, mi how might that be changing uh, right now? Um, so... Uh, 
what does old policy making look like? What, what is the thing we're trying to move away from? Um, I, I mean, the difficulty, there was, there was never a time, I think, when I hope, when policy makers quite lived up to the Whitehall stereotype. But um, here goes, with a thousand apologies to all those generations of brilliant civil servants and ministers and academics for whom this is totally unfair, let me present to you the stereotype of the old policy making. Let me characterise what we might mean by old fashioned policy making. Um, uh, I was going to start by referring to Yes Minister, and I was worried that was a bit old hat, but as David got in a reference to Dad's army, I think I can get away with it. Um, so, OK, old policy making. Uh, it's a Yes Minister world. Uh, closed doors, well-worn sophistries. Civil servants and ministers are developing ideas with no particular knowledge of or actually much interest uh, in the real world. Uh, there's paperwork and bureaucracy. There's white all turf wars. There's tight regulation, which normally gets tighter. Policies are based on, entirely on conviction. Not much knowledge of what's actually effective or why. Uh, reforms are delivered always through organisations and agencies and public bodies, usually set up by statute. Indeed, reforms are designed to be delivered that way. Public services are the preserve of the state. The private sector does exist, but exists in the form of, as far as government's concerned, near monopolies with whom we do repeat business on terms massively disadvantageous to the taxpayer. The voluntary sector is there. It kind of its job is to sort of collect charitable donations from the public and grant and aid from government and do its stuff. Uh, academics, of course, are there. They comment from their gorgeous universities, you know, from a distance. And there is ambition of sorts, but it's not one of kind of incremental improvement, doing the same things a bit better, a bit cheaper. That's the limit of the ambition. And the providing focus is on getting more money out of the Treasury, um, uh, working out how we can spend the next budget windfall, which additional services we can pile on to sit alongside all the others. So that's the kind of stereotype. That's the old stuff. Um, and uh, as I say, a thousand apologies um, to those whom I'm grossly misrepresenting. So if that's the stereotype of old-fashioned policy making, uh, it might give you some idea of what innovation uh, could look like. Um, first of all, innovation uh, in policy making tends not to mean a single solution to problems. Uh, I'm going to borrow from uh, a report that Nesta and Denmark's Mind Lab wrote a year ago, which many of you, I'm sure, would have read. Some of you in this room might have contributed to. I don't know. Uh, innovation, they wrote, is a way of coping with problems with no evident solutions. Uh, it's an attitude uh, that recognises that social problems are really quite complicated things. Uh, they're made up of how people behave, their health, how their community works, how their neighbourhood works, how rewards and incentives are arranged, what makes a particular estate in South London tick or a particular family. Uh, it recognises that public services are experienced by real people who don't always respond in the way that we might imagine in the policy engine room. So new policy making might feel uh, experimental, uh, small scale, rapid, local, personal. It might take advantage of real time data. It might use prototypes. It won't be afraid to fail. Uh, it's no coincidence that a lot of those words um, describe quite well the now standard digital way of working, the, the, uh, the agile approach. Um, new policy making might take advantage of other people's skills and enthusiasms. It will watch where the energies and ideas are in the space outside government and how government might just act as a catalyst or a facilitator or a convener. Uh, it might invest in people's re resilience, their ability to help themselves uh, or their communities. Uh, and the community organisers programme uh, from the Cabinet Office is an example of that. Uh, and that's something we wrestle with in, in the charity that David mentioned um, in South London. Um, how, do we, how, do we, how do we intervene in a way that just stimulates an energy that's there, someone who's unsung, someone in the community who can really make a difference? What can we do cheaply to make that person um, uh, make a difference? It's sometimes innovative policy making, um, it's certainly incompatible, incompatible with an attitude that Whitehall knows best. Curiously, it's incompatible with an attitude that anyone knows best. Um, it's sometimes uh, another characteristic, it sometimes won't need legislation, it won't need enabling powers. It might deliver an outcome through direct government intervention, but it might not. It might deliver an outcome through, let's say, a social impact bond that's backed by an investment fund, or through an application that someone's designed, to take a random example from the data field, an application that someone designed using flood data from the Environment Agency. Who knows? Or through a service run by a social enterprise that's benefited from targeted tax relief. So direct government innovation intervention uh, isn't necessarily how it's going to be delivered. So if that gives you a flavour... Uh, of what uh, I think innovative policy making might look like. Let me get a bit more specific and tell you about some of the techniques uh, that we're using. Um, now, my friend Chris Wormald, who's a permsec at Education and head of the government's policy profession, will tell you that there's, you know, there's innovation of all sorts going, across, going on across government in, in lots of departments, uh, a lot of it in pockets, certainly inconsistent, 
Uh, we could certainly do more. Uh, but there's a lot of it going on in patches. Um, I'm going to give you a survey of just some of the things uh, that are going on. And inevitably, there's going to be a bit of a cabinet office bias to, to, to my list. But I'm going to start with what we call in government open policy making. Um, now, this, um, hands up, is not exactly revolutionary. Uh, you could say it's simply policy done well. Um, the Civil Service Reform Plan two years ago diagnosed that the quality of policy making can be inconsistent and that it needed to be improved. And open policy making is really a way of tackling that problem, opening up policy to new evidence, uh, to new voices, and to new ways of thinking and doing. So the open policy waking, making way uh, is to uh, not to internalize or monopolize problems and thinking, assuming we know best, you know, develop a list of options in private, ready to form the meat of a ministerial submission. You know, the sort of three options, the first one's expensive, the third one's mad, I recommend the second, you know, that sort of stuff, it's, it's not that. Um, we recognize that we don't have the answers, we don't have all the answers, and crucially, we recognize that the pace of change uh, is, is greater than our ability to keep up. So what do we do um, in open policy making? First of all, we engage all the experts, um, and this calls for a degree of humility, a recognition, as I say, that we're not the experts, uh, but also, it, it requires us not to rely on the easy bunch of stakeholders or experts, the same small group of people who will tell us the same things. So it's about recognising the expertise of users, frontline staff who really know the impact of our policies on the ground, the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, and engaging them at every stage, going to them rather than expecting people to come to you, uh, not expecting them to necessarily have the resources to fill out a response to a formal consultation, but going to them and seeking out their contribution. So you find that sort of approach at Hack Days, uh, which organisations such, such as Rewired State put on. Uh, you saw it in the crowdsourcing behind the Red Tape Challenge. Uh, we try to do it uh, with the good law conversation on Twitter uh, and with the idea of user testing, user testing laws themselves. Um, it's also about a willingness to be challenged. Uh, and this, again, is a difficult quality. A lot of this stuff is difficult for the conventional civil service. This is difficult. Um, uh, it's a difficult um, quantity because um, uh, I mean, the, the willingness to be challenged is, is um, it's currently being tested by the Ministerial Contestability Fund, uh, which allows ministers, our political bosses, actually to ask us for a second opinion or to ask someone else for a second opinion, um, to not rely on civil service advice, to get a different view about what the evidence is telling us and what might work. Next, open policy making requires us to be open to different techniques and approaches. So, um, approaches such as, obvious one, data science, unknown to government five years ago. Data science, which will allow us to, to use intelligently and creatively, you know, the astonishing quality and, and velocity uh, uh, of data sets, the footprint or the, the exhaust of modern life. How do we examine them? How do we combine and draw evidence from big, fast-moving data sets? How do we draw the right conclusions? How do we avoid analytical booby traps? Techniques like ethnography, where you literally follow users and frontline staff and watch them, observe them. What happens to them? How they behave? What works for them? What doesn't? Um, and third, open policy making is about not being afraid to try and fail. Um, again, that's not easy for Westminster and Whitehall. Uh, there are, believe it or not, strong incentives to be risk-averse. Failure is not massively popular amongst ministers or civil servants. I don't think that's, um, that's a secret. And maybe that's because um, traditionally failure is associated with big expensive failure. So that's how we think of failure, big expensive failure. Um, but I'm talking, as, as you would have um, deduced, about a, a different sort of failure, a different sort of uh, experimental behavior. So that's open policy making, which is a kind of umbrella. So next up is behavioral economics. This is, of course, seriously fashionable stuff. Um, and uh, I'm sure I think there's a session on it later, so I'll be kind of brief. Um, why is this discipline so interesting for government? Uh, well, very simply, it offers a potential for improving outcomes, really substantially improving outcomes, through really quite small and, get this, really quite cheap um, changes in design that tend to harness people's inclinations and behaviours. So um, our behavioural insights team um, is now a part mutualised independent company, um, uh, co-owned by ourselves and Nesta. It will uh, continue to deliver a core service to government, but it will also be able to work with organisations beyond central government and, as now, uh, um, uh, with universities. Uh, the hallmark of how they go about things um, is um, gathering evidence through robust trials and experiments, including, including randomised control trials, which, again, is, is something that, that government has not been familiar with before they're implemented at scale. So it's not all theoretical. Um, the learning gives you a hunch, and that's tested, and that becomes a heavily evidence-based discipline. So the best-known example, which I'm sure several of you know, is a simple one. The team were asked to look at forms reminding people who haven't paid their tax to pay their tax. 
and they did randomized control trials, and it turns out that when you're chasing people who have failed to pay, it works best if you tell them that most other people have already paid their tax. Very, very simple. That, on an HMRC form, resulted in a 5% increase in payments rates, which, if you think of the scale of HMRC's operation, is a huge, huge sum coming uh, earlier to the Exchequer. So that's the power of the herd, people responding to community norms. Didn't require legislation, just a very simple redesign on a form. Actually, that example, that's so well known that when this picture turned up recently on Twitter, it caused some knowing hilarity amongst uh, uh, in several circles. This is New York Taxi, and it seems to be getting the herd idea the wrong way around. 60% of taxi passengers do not buckle up. So if 60% are not, gonna, are not wearing their seatbelts, you know, why should you? So it seems to get it the wrong way around, but it's New York City, who knows? Who knows what the behavioral impulses are, are there? But as I say, um, that caused a chuckle or two. Um, so next, I want to stay with the theme of evidence uh, and tell you about the What Works movement. Um, this, is, uh, this is a network which the government has set up in partnership with the research councils and uh, Big Lottery uh, and others. Um, it's a network made up of six centres, six What Works centres, and these cover major areas of public policy and public services. So they cover uh, health and social care is one, education, crime reduction, local economic growth, early intervention, and better ageing. Now, these are all areas where there's a pretty decent academic evidence base on what interventions work and what doesn't, what, which don't, but that information somehow hasn't got through in a digestible form, accessible form to policymakers and to decision makers on the front line, head teachers, uh, police, uh, doctors. So the point of the What Works Institutes is to collate, synthesize, disseminate the evidence base, ensure that decision makers, whether they're in charge of national policy or local budgets, can access evidence about which approaches will deliver the best outcomes. Now, there's kind of nothing new in that either. Um, similar things have been around before, and indeed one of the centres is well known to all of us. It's NICE, National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. Um, but the initiative, the Works Initiative, is an attempt to kind of prioritise uh, evidence to improve policy and practice through a national network of institutions. The, so the, the, the stereotype, the old way of doing evidence-based policy making was you know what you want to do, you scrub around, you give a bit of evidence, you attach the two and you know, Bob's your uncle. Uh, this is about actually systematically making sure that there is an accessible evidence base um, available to you. Um, one of the centres, the one on education, uh, Sutton Trust has produced a toolkit on uh, teaching and learning. A toolkit, literally, an accessible summary of educational research which provides teachers with guidance on how to use their resources, ranking different innovations, interventions in terms of the size of the impact, how much they cost, the strength of the evidence, uh, and so on. And it's a live resource. It depends on ongoing research, trials, experiments. Uh, there are experiments to test digital innovations, one-to-one uh, -one online training, text messages to, to keep parents informed about homework and all that. So um, it's a kind of live, uh, live growing, on, on, ongoing uh, resource. I pause breath there. I mean, there's there's lots more I could tell you about. Um, I could tell you about I could tell you about social investment, uh, which is creating new funding streams from private and philanthropic capital, uh, where payback turns up uh, if you achieve outcomes, um, uh, and the capital available is new capital from phil philanthropists who are prepared to forego a bit of commercial return, but they're not charitable donations. So tapping into a brand new investment stream, world leading. London's now the world centre for social impact bonds. I could tell you about catalyzing the ideas and knowledge and energy of the voluntary sector, which I've mentioned. I've mentioned community organizers, but there's a wider story about what the sector can do with its, you know, its knowledge and its passion, its local knowledge, if it's supported in the right way, if it's encouraged to be investment ready, if it's encouraged um, to, 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 to use evidence uh, and so on. I could tell you about the power of opening up government data to encourage innovation and to promote better choices uh, for citizens. Uh, you're gonna be covering that in the next session, uh, so I won't. I could tell you about our new policy lab, so this draws on the, the Danish uh, mind lab um, uh, I told you about earlier. It launched last week, our own policy lab. Um, it uh, draws on all sorts of international experiences. It will apply some of the techniques I've talked about to real policy problems in departments. Uh, we'll try some stuff. Uh, we'll learn. Uh, we'll probably fail occasionally. Uh, we'll do it again. We'll try again. The first project uh, is with the Home Office, and it's about improving people's experience of reporting crime. But um, I, I won't go on and on, and I certainly, I certainly, what I don't want to do is give you the impression that you know, we've got it licked now in government. We know the techniques that will get out, out of this. I don't want to give that impression at all, um, because we haven't. This is, this is a really big challenge for the civil service, and frankly for ministers as well, for the political class. Uh, meeting this challenge will take sustained skills, new skills, sustained commitment, uh, and time. Um, but instead, I just want to leave you with three closing thoughts. Uh, the first is a question. 
Um, where will all this stuff end up? Where will policy making be in five years' time? So think of the stereotype and think of the stuff that I've been talking about. Maybe in five years' time or in ten years' time or in 20 years time, five years' time, maybe we'll have totally open source policy making, user design services, full transparency, experimental government, every policy being evaluated richly in real time, billions of pounds of spending directly linked to the evidence base. Maybe that's what will happen. Or maybe, maybe not. I mean, I, I kind of hope the future will be a bit like that, I have to say, a lot like that. But I suspect that elements of traditional policy making will survive for a while yet, for all sorts of reasons, some, some good, some bad. I suspect, for example, that a healthy democracy will always need, will always tend to a fair amount of conventional conviction-based policies. I don't think that's going to go away, uh, and conviction politicians. It'll be fascinating to hear the politicians later if you ask them about this balance between conviction and evidence, where, 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 they, where they come down. So I suspect that'll be around for a while. Um, and it occurred to me, wearing my lawyer's hat, that a world in which outcomes could be achieved without legislation, in a sense, that's my good law dream come true. You know, no new legislation. We can tidy everything up. It'll be fine. But a world in which outcomes could be achieved without legislation uh, would be one in which we didn't need a legislature. And that's a really interesting thought. Last time someone took that view, we lost a king. Um, so uh, I think integrating new forms of policy making with our democratic institutions is, um, I think it's a subject probably requiring requiring a bit more thought. And I think the same could be said for the ethical context for some of this sort of new type of policy innovation. Public policy, um, just as public science, um, will always take place, I hope, in an ethical framework. Um, and we need, uh, on the policy side, as, as you do on the scientific side, constantly to check that our ethical framework uh, is up to date. Um, so some of the things I've talked about, nudge, data science, randomised control trials, social impact bonds. I think as we get used to these techniques and others, we will need to think about and be clear about uh, the ethical framework. Second thought is this. Um, the new policy environment, which I've you know, tried to sketch out, the stuff we've been talking about today, is of interest to everyone um, who's involved in trying to make things change in our society and our economy. This isn't just for government. So if you're in a local authority in Cambridgeshire, or a charity in South London, uh, or a social enterprise in Manchester, you're going to be interested in all sorts of these things, harnessing technology, accessing an evidence base, supporting people who can make a difference in a community to bring about the outcomes you want to see. You're going to want to form partnerships, explore new business models, use data intelligently. I genuinely see the policy community, the people who are going to benefit from these ideas, as, as really quite a broad thing. And I think that maybe that's another aspect of open policy making. Policy is not a Whitehall thing, it's not a local authority thing, it's perhaps not even a public sector thing. Anyone who wants to make a difference in society are going to be asking ourselves the same problems, the same questions, and I hope are benefiting mutually from each other's answers. And the final thing. Um, I mean, that slide is, is deliberately blank. Uh, we can't rest on where things are today. We, we have to be continually open to new technologies, new scientific breakthroughs, I mean, we in government, uh, and new ideas. We, we don't know what's around the corner. Uh, we've got some pretty big challenges that uh, uh, will stay with us. I mentioned a few of them earlier, but there'll be more. There'll be more to come. Uh, so we've got to be good at horizon scanning. Um, and I bet that we will be solving some of those problems, uh, some of those problems with solutions that we don't know exist right now. So in that spirit, um, a small cabinet office team has been working with, I think, MPhil students at the Centre for science and policy. We've been asking them to challenge the current thinking on the role of technology in meeting strategic challenges on well-being in the UK and to produce a suite of ideas to help inform and challenge our thinking on the issue of ageing in particular. So the project's looking at technology and healthy ageing, social engagement, tackling isolation. Um, and with that thought, that's where I'm going to conclude because it gives me a chance, first of all, to say thank you to our hosts for that collaboration uh, as well as for today's conference. Uh, and also to say that I hope that we, um, government, uh, universities, the other sectors, um, can do more, lots, lots more like that so that all members of the extended community, the policy community that I mentioned, can work together to find uh, new, affordable ways of making good things happen. Thank you very much. Thank you.